This summer we're in a series called Abraham, the Man of Faith. Today we're going to be looking at a, a chapter. It's chapter 20, where God comes to a man in a dream and tells him, you are a dead man. How many of you want to hear or see God come into your dreams with that kind of an announcement? Yeah. So before we look at Genesis 20, let me give you a short review. In chapter 16, it ends by telling us, the reader, that Abram was 86 years old when the Egyptian maid to Sarai, bore, named Hagar, bore Ishmael to him. And then the very next chapter, first verse, it tells us that he's 99 years old. So 13 years went by without any kind of record of what took place. And in chapter 17, the Lord appeared to Abram as El Shaddai, meaning God Almighty. We just sang a song about God Almighty. Abram's name uh, was changed to Abraham, and Sarai's name was changed to Sarah. And Abraham was told that Sarah would bear him a son. Sarah would. And he was to give him the name of Isaac. Chapter 18 goes on to talk about, or chapter 17 talks about the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham was 99 when he was circumcised, and Ishmael was 13. In chapter 18, the Lord appeared again to Abraham, this time with two others as Abraham was sitting by his tent door. And he was told that Sarah would bear a son. And she heard this and she laughed. And you have that great verse where the Lord says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Sarah denied laughing and was kind of rebuked. And no, you did laugh. And the rest of chapter 18 and all of 19, the account picks up with what takes place in Sodom. That God destroyed Sodom, but he rescued Lot. Which brings us up to chapter 20. So reading in the first verse of chapter 20, Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister, and she herself said, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech arose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing, and the men were greatly frightened. Interesting chapter. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Here we have Abraham, the man of faith, acting contrary to faith once again. So I titled this message, The Man of Faith Lied Again. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we do come before you, and as we look at this scripture... We're going to be reminded that even righteous people, even men 
and women of faith still fall into sin. So Lord, guide us this morning. Teach us through the power of the Spirit what we need to learn and take away from the Word of God. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. In this scenario of telling others that Sarah was Abraham's sister does sound familiar, doesn't it? In Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you're a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. It came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Chapter 20, very similar. And righteous people do fail, as this text shows us. My theme this morning is your testimony as a person of faith living among an ungodly culture matters greatly. You have a testimony if you're a person of faith. And it matters how you behave people are watching. Now the whole structure of this chapter is what's called chiastic. If you have the notes, I put that actually in there. The narrator started the chapter in verses 1 and 2, and then we have God conversing with Abimelech in 3 to 7. Abimelech shared his encounter with God in verse 8. And then Abimelech conversed with Abraham in 9 through 16. And then the narrator ends the chapter in verses 17 and 18. The structure is pretty simple. It's called a chiasm. So as we go back to verses 1 and 2, we can see that Abraham relapsed and used deception for protection. In verse 1, we're told that Abraham journeyed from there. Where's the there? Well, Hebron, maybe the Oaks of Mamre, maybe the there is when he was overlooking Sodom when it was going up in smoke. It doesn't tell us exactly where the there is, but it says he journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. And so let's get a map. Peter has been showing me how to use this, and Peter, it just went off. Press home to get to the home screen. There it is. Okay. I love IT work. (laughs) Okay, we have a map. (laughs) It's there. Okay, so... Nope, what did I hit? Get that off. How do I get off the the thing? Well, I'm using a fountain pen. There we go. Here's Hebron and the Oaks of Mamre. I need that here. Okay, here's Oaks of Mamre. This is the Negev, the Southland. Okay. He's journeying from here down to almost Beer Lahai Roy. That's where the Lord, the angel of the Lord, met with Hagar by the well of the living one who sees. That's what they named that. Well, he doesn't stay here. He goes up to this land called the land of Gerar. 
This is the capital of Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. So he comes here. So he's traveling from here, not straight there, but going way down, sojourning. We don't know how long this took, and he ends up here. Okay, we got it? All right. I'll fix this and get it, learn how to do it in the next service. <laughs> Why did he leave? Well, the text doesn't tell us. Perhaps he just wanted to get far away from Sodom's destruction. Perhaps he just felt like, I'm, I'm kind of living in tents anyway. It's time for a new pasture. I'm just going to wander down to where there's better pasture. I just feel like it's time to move. Any of you ever just feel like after a certain amount of years in one home, oh, it's time to move? Just me? Okay. Well, we don't know why he's wandering. We don't know where he's going. He's kind of just going south. How long he stayed in Hebron after the destruction of Sodom, we don't know. How long does he stay in between uh, Kadesh and Shur? We don't know. But he journeys on to Gerar. And the second verse tells us that Abram said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. He let it be known that his wife, Sarah, was his sister. Who did he tell that to? We're not told who he told that to. He just let it be known that I wonder if it's part of his greeting. Hi, hello, my name is Abraham, and this is Sarah, my sister. I don't know how it came about, but pretty soon everyone got to know that That woman, that's what that man is, his sister. And so at the end of verse 2, his wife was sent for and taken by Abimelech, who's king of Gerar. Abimelech means in Hebrew, Abi is my father, Amelech is king. So it means my father is king. It's probably a royal title that's given to this king. Because there's other kings that are called Abimelech in Scripture as well. Now, back in that day, a king's prerogative was to choose all the pretty women to bring into his harem. And perhaps he wanted to make an alliance with this very wealthy man who just moved into his territory. And how long... Sarah was in the king's house before we get to verse 3. We're not told. A day? A week? A month? But Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and he took Sarah. And the next thing we have is verse 3, where God came to him in a dream of the night. See, God protected what Abraham risked, the promise of an heir. And in verse 3, we see God threatened the king with death for taking a married woman. You're a dead man because of the woman you have taken, for she is married. This is a night dream. And God will use in the book of Genesis dreams to reveal his will to outsiders, meaning those that are not part of Abraham's family. In Genesis 31, verse 24, God appears to Laban and says to him, do not talk good or bad to Jacob. We all know about the Egyptian cupbearer and the baker who each had a dream. In chapter 40, verse 5, and then Pharaoh, king of Egypt, has two dreams in Genesis 41, verse 1. God will use dreams to reveal his will to outsiders. And in verses 4 and 5, we see that Abimelech professed his innocence. And the narrator at the very beginning of that verse makes it really clear Abimelech had not come near her. And he respectfully asks the Lord after he got a death sentence in verse 3, he says, Lord, 
Lord, Adonai, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Interestingly, in verse 3, God says, you, singular, are a dead man. And in verse 4, he's talking about his whole nation, his people. He says, blameless. That means innocent. It's actually the word that's used righteous in chapter 18 when Abraham said similar words when he says, bar far be it from you to slay the righteous with the wicked in chapter 18, verse 25. That word righteous is the same word we have here for blameless. Notice that Abimelech is appealing to God's justice. Are you going to slay a nation even though we're, we're blameless in this? And then in verse 5, you can see that he claimed his actions were based on their lies. Did he, did Abraham not himself say, she is my sister? And she, Sarah, herself said, he is my brother. It's their lies. And he asserts his integrity and his innocence in bringing her into his house. He says, in the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God admitted his innocence and gave him then commands to follow in verses 6 and 7. He admits his integrity at the very beginning. Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this. And in this verse, these two verses, we see that God protected Sarah even though she was totally unaware of that protection. He says, I also kept you from sinning against me. God kept Abimelech from sinning against him. We often think uh, adultery is a sin only against the spouse, against man. God is saying, it's against me. I've kept you from sinning against me. Now, God is not Abimelech's God, but he is God. And adultery would have been a sin against him. Later in Genesis, we're told of a story of Joseph being sold into Potiphar's house, and he rises up to become the, well, the guy in charge of Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife then tries to seduce him. And Joseph says to her in Genesis 39.9, there is no one greater in this house than I, and he has, Potiphar has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? It's a sin against God. And after David sins with Bathsheba, he writes a psalm of confession in Psalm 51. And in this psalm of contrition for his adultery, he says in verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Sexual sin is really a sin against God. He did not create you for that. And here in a dream, Abimelech, even though he's innocent, he says, uh, I kept you from sinning against me. He says, I did not let you touch her. Sarah is totally unaware of that. But God was protecting her. And God gives Abimelech a choice in verse 7. 
He gives the command, restore the man's wife. And here's the reason. He is a prophet. And he will pray for you. And you will live. But the choice, you can choose this way too. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die. You and all who are yours. He's a prophet. Do you realize this is the first time the word nabi, prophet, is used in scripture? And it's used in a way that he's to be an intercessor. He's already been told he was a dead man in verse 3. But he's told here, if you don't restore her, no, you will surely die. You and all these others will die. Well, in verse 8, Abimelech believed God's word. He, he believed this because notice what he does right away. He obeyed God's word. He rose early in the morning as soon as he got up. Early. He called all his servants. He told all these things in their hearing, and the men were greatly frightened. He wasted no time in setting things right early in the morning. He shared with all his servants this revelation that he had with God in a dream. This woman I just took into my house, she's married. By the way, we're all going to be dead if we don't return her. And they feared greatly. Why? Because they instantly believed the truth of what took place. Oh, Abimelech, you just had a bad dream. We all get nightmares like that. No, they believed. And in verse 9, Abimelech calls Abraham to him. And Abimelech rebuked Abraham and restored his wife to him. Look at verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you brought on me, on my kingdom, a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? Abimelech questioned Abraham for his deceptive dealings by asking four accusatory questions. What have you done? What have you done to us? He says done to us because if you look down in verse 18, the Lord had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. The narrator saves that for the very end, but this was reality for Abimelech and his house. None of the women could get pregnant. The Lord had closed up all the wounds. John Walton in his commentary says, anything that prevented childbirth is considered closing up the womb." It could have been impotence upon the men. It could have been STDs that were now showing up in both men and women. It could have been just infertility of women. It could have been miscarriages. Everybody that had a baby lost it. We're not told how he closed up the wounds, but it was evident to all the nation at this time that there would be no more children. Why 
what have you done to us, is the question. Second question is, how have I, how have I as the king sinned against you that you brought this great sin upon us? Third question, you have done to me things that ought not to be done. It's like he's saying, normal people don't act the way you're acting. And the fourth question is, what have you encountered that you have done this thing? What, what is so bad in your life that you have come to afflict me in my kingdom? And then Abraham gets a chance to respond in verse 11. Abraham said, because I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I told to her, this is the kindness which you will show to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother." Abraham made excuses for his sinful behavior. And you're thinking to yourself, just tell the truth. He prejudged the people as godless. There's no fear of God here, and they're going to kill me for my wife. Worse is verse 12, where he rationalized his lie. She is actually is my half-sister. She's a daughter of my father, but not a daughter of my mother. Half-truth is what? 100% lie. And what you don't know in verse 13 is that he's actually blaming God for his wandering. The word for wander there, caused me to wander, is this word ta'a in Hebrew, ta'a, which means he caused me to wander aimlessly. Without purpose. It's used in the very next chapter, in chapter 21, where it says, Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. She wandered about. She was wandering aimlessly. He's blaming God that God caused me to just wander aimlessly. In fact, that same word is used in that great passage of Isaiah 53, 6, which says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. All of us like sheep have gone astray. That's the word. To go astray, to go wander away. Abraham's actually blaming God for his wanderings. And then lastly, he blames Sarah when he implicates her in the lie, saying, do me this kindness. Everywhere we go, save me. He is my brother. You know, that's a command. Wouldn't it have been refreshing if he just owned up to his wrongdoing? <laughs> Instead of making excuses and rationalizing and blaming others, Abimelech, he could have said, Abimelech, you're right. You're right. I should have told you the truth. Sarah is my wife. Every trouble that you and your servants have now is totally my fault. But no, he doesn't say words like that. He failed. That's what I love about Scripture. Scripture shows the failures of men and women. Because we need to see us in those failures. We need to see ourselves in those failures.
we too have great trouble admitting sin, don't we? Right? How often do you sin? How often do you sin against people in your own family or people close to you? How often do you tell them, I was wrong? Okay? So, sin a lot, confess little. Isn't that our lives? We sin a lot, we admit it very little. We're not much different from Abraham. And what follows seems so incredibly unlikely. Because remember in chapter 12, when he did the same kind of sin, Pharaoh said, get out. (laughs) He expelled them from the land. Had his soldiers, so to speak, escort them to the end of the land to make sure they left. But here in 14 through 16, we see with great generosity the king showed them that he was a man of integrity. Look at verse 14. Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it's your vindication before all who are with you. And before all men, you are cleared. See, with great generosity, the king shows him favor. Notice he gave Abraham livestock servants. He restored. He gave Sarah back to him. He gave Abraham the choice of the land in which to settle. He said, settle anywhere. He gave that. And he gave Abraham a thousand pieces of silver as vindication before all that Sarah was clear of any wrongdoing in this whole situation. John Walton in his commentary says, that thousand pieces of silver is like 25 pounds of silver. It's more than one man could make in his entire lifetime. That's generosity. Did you notice in verse 16? He's talking to Sarah and he says, Behold, I have given your brother. (laughs) Restore her, that's the man's wife. Did he not say he is my brother? Did she not say he is my brother? And didn't he say she's my sister? This is a small little dig at the lie that was perpetuated upon him. Why the generosity? It's not because Abraham and Sarah deserve the generosity, right? They don't deserve it. But the God that they worship and serve deserves great honor. God deserves it. This is mostly to appease him for the death sentence that he had hanging over their head. In verse 17, we have Abraham prayed, and God healed them. Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech. So whatever was the problem, it was on him too. And his wife and his maid, so they bore children. And the narrator tells us because Yahweh, first time he's mentioned as Yahweh in the text, Yahweh had closed fast all the wombs. As a prophet, Abraham prayed to God. He interceded for the king and for his people. And God healed Abimelech, his wife and maids, making them fertile again. Do you realize this is the first recording of a healing in answer to a prayer in Scripture? Victor Hamilton, in his 
the book of Genesis, chapters 18 through 50 of the Nikot series. He wrote, If the word brother was ironic in Abimelech's mouth, then here is another instance of irony. Abraham can pray, and as a result, barren Philistine women are able to conceive, yet his own wife has not yet been able to become pregnant. The question of Sarah bearing a child, like the Lord told Abraham in chapter 17 and 18, has still not happened. It happens in the next chapter which is not going to be for today. i got to get you to keep coming back, right? (laughs) Warren Wiersbe, in his commentary, he wrote this. If you did not know who Abraham was and you read this chapter for the first time, which of the two men would you say was the believer? Surely not Abraham the liar. It was not Abraham who showed integrity. And it was not Abraham whom God kept from sinning. What Abraham did was selfish. But Abimelech responded with generosity. If anybody reveals excellent character, it's Abimelech and not Abraham, the friend of God. Testimony matters. But what I find fascinating in this chapter is the guy without faith in God behaved well. He had integrity. The guy without the faith in God behaved well. The text made it clear that Abimelech had not come near Sarah, verse 4, that he was innocent of any wrongdoing, verse 5, and God agreed that he was innocent in verse 6. And even today, some unbelievers seem to live more ethically than some Christians. It ought not to be that way. Abimelech may have been drawn to Abraham's God, not because of the testimony of Abraham, but by the power and greatness of God himself. God confronted the king in a dream. God prevented the women from bearing children. God closed wombs. God opened them. He is God. Secondly, the guy with faith in God behaved badly. He was fearful. He repeated the same sin of the past, which caused many complications. He put his wife in harm's way. He jeopardized the promise of an heir coming through Sarah. And I think to myself, aren't we like Abraham? Don't we do the same sins over and over? Abraham should have ripped out that play in his life playbook which said, when you become fearful of unknown people, lie. It's not a good strategy. He should change the play to, when fearful of unknown people or anything you're fearful of, trust God, act on his truth, and speak truth. And the reason why Christians commit the same sin over and over is not because they haven't confessed it, but because they haven't repented of it. To use the illustration, ripping it out of the playbook. In Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He who conceals his, he who hides his transgressions, his rebellions, will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. See, you gotta forsake it, you gotta repent of it, you gotta turn from it. But 
But what I find most fascinating in this chapter is God himself. He acted to protect the covenant that Abraham put in jeopardy. Remember in chapter 18, the Lord appears to Abraham and says, uh, this time next year, Sarah will bear a child. We're getting close to the, the promise of the heir, and then this scene, this whole thing intervenes in the early months before she gets pregnant, puts the whole promise in jeopardy. God says, I made sure, Abimelech, you didn't come near her. You didn't touch her. It's all God. And God's the one who set Abimelech straight regarding Abraham, who looked like he was nothing but a deceiver, by telling him he's a prophet. And he's the one who will pray for you to live. The one who just deceived you and caused all this grief to come upon you, he's the one that's going to bring healing to you. So what you do, Abimelech, is going to matter. You have a choice. You can live or die. It all depends on are you going to follow my instruction and return his wife. And in chapter 20, verse 17, God answered Abraham's prayer. Just getting him to turn around to pray for these people he just insulted. That had to be a work of God, right? I can imagine Abimelech saying to him, now, now you're, you're supposed to pray for me, please. <laughs> what? What? Abraham does. So my theme, again, is your testimony as a person of faith living among an ungodly culture, which is our culture right now, it matters greatly. People watch what you do. People watch what you say. So are you drawing people to Jesus by your actions or are people being pushed away from Jesus because of your actions. Big difference of how you live your life. We're to be lights in a dark world. After all, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So how's your testimony? Do we sin? Absolutely. Do we confess it to God? Sometimes. Do we confess it to the people we sinned against? Rarely. We're to be different. We're to own up to our mistakes. We're to repent from our sin, turn away from them, not go back to it. People are watching. People are watching this church, watching you, watching me. Is my testimony bringing glory to God or is it bringing shame? Lord, we come before you thinking of this chapter. It's so close to the birth of Isaac and the heir, the promise. And yet the text is really clear. Abraham, Abraham almost blew it. Thank you that you're a God, you're sovereign, you're in control, you're all powerful. You can have your will done even through a dream. Father, I pray that each one of us, men, women, boy, girl, who name the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord, would allow the Holy Spirit of God to not only 
the fact that the Spirit is in us, but we're to be filled by the Spirit. We're to walk by the Spirit. We're to live in the Spirit. Because then we will not give in to the, well, the lusts of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. So, Lord, I confess to you that sometimes I am slow to confess and slower to repent of a sin. And sometimes I, too, have trouble admitting wrongdoing. And like Abraham, I rationalize sin. But, Lord God, I'm not the only one. So do a work in each one of us. Change us. Help us to realize how important our testimony is in this culture in which we live. We want to be light. We want people to see you because they see you in us. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, the one who loved us, the one who gave himself up for us so that we could have life. We pray this in his name.